Hi, I'm Ted Weber. I'm going to give a brief overview of climate science, mitigation, and adaptation. To briefly introduce myself, I work as an ecologist and climate adaptation analyst. I have degrees in systems ecology and wetland ecology. I'm a certified forest ecologist and have worked on wildlife, habitat, and climate-related projects for over 20 years for the State of Maryland, the Conservation Fund, and Defenders of Wildlife. First, I'll talk about the greenhouse effect and how it is increasing temperatures, melting glaciers, raising sea levels, and causing other negative effects. Then I'll talk about ways people can reduce the amount of future warming and damage, and what can be done to adapt to the warming that's already occurring. Let's start with atmospheric physics. The energy from the sun comes into the earth in the form of light radiation that cuts through the atmosphere and warms the planet. 29% of the sun's energy is reflected back into space. Almost half is absorbed by the earth's surface. Some of this is radiated back into space as infrared radiation. Carbon dioxide, along with water vapor, methane, and a number of other molecules is a greenhouse gas. It lets in the ultraviolet and light energy from the sun, but traps some of the longer wavelength heat energy that radiates back from the surface of the earth. Some trapping is good. It keeps the planet's surface warm enough for life. But the problem is that we are increasing the concentration of greenhouse gases, which traps more of the outgoing infrared energy and is warming the planet beyond the levels at which ecosystems and human civilization are adapted. These graphs show atmospheric absorption and scattering at different wavelengths. The largest absorption band of carbon dioxide is similar to the thermal emission wavelengths from the ground, and it also partly closes the window of transparency of water, hence its major effect. This shows radiative forcing of different greenhouse gases. Because it is the most abundant, carbon dioxide is the largest driver of climate change and it remains in the atmosphere for thousands of years. Methane only lasts about a decade in the atmosphere, but each molecule of methane absorbs much more energy than carbon dioxide molecules, making methane the second most significant greenhouse gas. Nitrous oxide molecules also absorb more energy than CO2. Nitrous oxide remains in the atmosphere for more than 100 years on average. Chlorofluorocarbons, hydrofluorocarbons, hydrochlorofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons, and sulfur hexafluoride are sometimes called high global warming potential gases because each molecule traps thousands of times more heat than a carbon dioxide molecule. Where does CO2 come from? For the most part, from respiration and combustion. Photosynthesis is the process where plants and certain microbes use chlorophyll or other molecules to combine CO2 and water to produce glucose needed for maintenance and growth. Respiration is the opposite process, using oxygen to break down organic molecules into CO2 and water to produce energy. Burning oil, coal, or natural gas is like respiration producing energy from long buried organic molecules and releasing CO2 into the atmosphere. Using ice cores, scientists have been able to track CO2 concentrations over the past 400,000 years. Temperatures follow CO2 concentrations almost exactly and caused changes big enough to start and end ice ages. As you can see here, Carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane, and sulfur dioxide concentrations have all been increasing dramatically in the past 100 years. This shows the past 20,000 years. There is a massive uptick of greenhouse gases, far above natural levels. The data show a very high correlation between surface temperatures and greenhouse gas concentrations. Next question, is this a natural process or is it human caused? Graph A shows that natural temperature drivers like volcanic emissions, 
solar output and orbital variances have remained flat over the past 140 years, whereas temperatures have increased sharply. Looking at graph B, human emissions of greenhouse gases, primarily fossil fuel combustion, moderated by the release of particulates like soot, match the observed temperature increases almost exactly. This diagram shows the stocks and fluxes of carbon in the land, ocean, underground, and the atmosphere. Numbers represent carbon stocks and pedigrams of carbon, where one pedigram equals one billion metric tons, and annual fluxes in pedigrams of carbon per year. Black numbers and arrows indicate estimated mass and fluxes prior to the industrial era, around 1750. Red arrows and numbers indicate annual fluxes that are more recent, um, specifically averaged over the 2000 to 2009 time period. First, you can see we've added around 240 petagrams of carbon to the atmosphere, which continues to increase. This comes mostly from burning fossil fuels, but also from clearing forests and other natural land. A lot of carbon is stored in the oceans, soils, permafrost, and vegetation, as well as in remaining fossil fuel reserves, quite a bit more than is currently in the atmosphere. The more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the higher the temperatures. If we stop burning fossil fuels and destroying forests, we can limit the increase to one to two degrees Celsius. Otherwise, it could climb up to four to five degrees Celsius, which would have devastating consequences. Let's talk about those consequences. Where is this extra heat going? What is it doing? What are its impacts? Some of the heat is going into the air, some is going into the oceans, some of it is melting ice, and some is evaporating water. These different pathways create different effects. The most obvious effect is higher temperatures. This has adverse effects on ecosystems and people. Animals like moose, wolverines, arctic foxes, and ptarmigans are adapted to cold weather and may not be able to survive in parts of their current ranges. On the other hand, warm winters benefit pests, weeds, and diseases. Mountain pine beetles have killed almost 30 million of pine trees across the American West over the past decade. One of the reasons for the huge size of this outbreak is that the beetles are benefiting from longer growing seasons and less harsh winters. The polar regions are warming fastest, especially Siberia and northern Alaska, which means trouble as the permafrost melts and releases methane. The southern Amazon is also warming rapidly, which is contributing to massive forest fires there. The Antarctic coast is also warming rapidly, which is causing its ice sheets to melt and slide into the ocean, raising sea levels. Heat waves are becoming more frequent and more extreme. Winters are also warming, which affects which plants and animals are best suited for a particular area. 93% of global warming goes into the ocean. And so like land temperatures, ocean temperatures are rising. NOAA's Northeast Fisheries Science Center has documented northward or deeper water shifts in nearly three quarters of species that it has investigated, including commercially important species like lobsters, mackerel, cod, flounder, haddock, and shad. Also, rising sea temperatures are leading to changes in fish populations off the coast of Maine, where many puffin parents raise their young. Only 31% of puffin chicks are now surviving, compared to 77% earlier. And algal blooms are exacerbated by warmer oceans and large precipitation events, and are harmful to seabirds, turtles, dolphins, whales, manatees, and fish.
of special concern, warmer waters cause coral bleaching. Coral reefs are some of the most biodiverse habitats on the planet, home to nearly a quarter of all ocean species. Prolonged high water temperatures, among other factors, can cause coral polyps to expel their symbiotic algal partners that help them produce food. The result is coral bleaching, which can kill the coral and puts the health of the whole reef system at risk. The world's largest reef, the Great Barrier Reef off the Australian coast, frequently suffers from catastrophic bleaching events in response to regular heat stress. In 2016, an estimated 30% of the Great Barrier Reef's corals died. Arctic sea ice has decreased on average between 3.5 and 4.1% per decade since the early 1980s. In September, when ice coverage reaches its annual minimum, the, the extent has decreased 10.7 to 15.9% per decade. Arctic sea ice loss is expected to continue, very likely resulting in nearly ice-free late summers by the 2040s. Glaciers and ice sheets are also melting rapidly. This shows how ice melting is accelerating. Seasonally frozen ground is also decreasing. Melting land ice and thermal water expansion are raising ocean levels. They have already risen an average of 20 centimeters since 1900. Sea level rise has dramatic effects in flat areas, and it is accelerating. More than 5,000 acres of wetlands have been lost in Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge since the 1930s. Annapolis, Maryland, where I live, is flooded by normal high tides now. Annapolis experienced 63 high tide floods in 2017, compared with about four in the early 1960s. Sea level is projected to increase up to 2.4 meters by 2100, or 8 feet. We are seeing dramatic tipping points in Greenland and Antarctica with major ice sheets collapsing into the sea. RCP 2.6 is the scenario where emissions peak before 2020, which they haven't. RCP 4.5 is the one where they peak around 2040, and RCP 8.5 is the one where they keep increasing as usual. Here's what New York City could look like with 2.5 meters of sea level rise. And here's what Baltimore could look like. Another effect is that warmer temperatures cause more evaporation and increased vapor concentrations in the air, which leads to bigger storms and worse droughts. The intensity, frequency, and duration of North Atlantic hurricanes, as well as the frequency of the strongest hurricanes, have all increased since the early 1980s. Models project that hurricane intensities and precipitation will further increase as the climate warms. Sea level rise is expected to further increase the extent of inland flooding from coastal storms. Shown here is flooding in downtown Annapolis, Maryland from Hurricane Isabel. Many regions of the country are already seeing more of the precipitation being concentrated into heavier rainfall events, creating potentially severe flooding. Then we're seeing longer periods of drought in between those strong storms. Due to higher temperatures increasing evapotranspiration, droughts have reached record intensity in parts of the U.S. The western U.S., especially the southwest, is predicted to dry even further due to reductions in precipitation and increased evaporation. The southwest is already in a mega drought, the worst in 500 years, and the Pacific coast has also experienced severe droughts recently. With increased drought, we are seeing increasingly calamitous fires all over the world. The incidence of large forest fires in the western U.S. and Alaska has increased since the early 1980s and is projected to further increase as the climate warms.
The world's oceans take up roughly a quarter of the carbon dioxide emitted every year. Most of the CO2 dissolves into the surface seawater and forms carbonic acid. The oceans have become 30% more acidic, and hydrogen ion concentration is projected to continue to increase at 0.5 to 1% per year. This impacts shell formation and the entire food webs of the oceans. Climate change can increase the risk of many infectious diseases through increased temperatures, heavier rainfall, and tropical diseases moving further north. Warming can also allow mosquitoes or ticks to expand their habitat ranges and reproduce more frequently. Some viruses also incubate faster inside mosquitoes and other vectors when temperatures are hotter. Climate change can also affect phenology, or the timing of plant and animal life events like migration, flowering, pollination, and seasonal color change. For instance, if a bird migrates based on changes in day length, but butterfly eggs hatch earlier because of warmer temperatures, the bird may arrive too late to provide enough caterpillars to feed its young. This shows projected changes, impacts, and risks to humans and ecosystems for land-based processes compared to the temperature increase. At the 1.1 degree of warming that's already occurred, we are already seeing water scarcities, soil erosion, vegetation loss, wildfire damage, permafrost degradation, crop yield declines, and food supply instabilities. The higher the temperature climbs, the more severe the impacts. Above two degrees, we will almost certainly see sustained food supply disruptions globally and major permafrost melting. Melting permafrost releases more CO2 and methane into the atmosphere one of the feedback loops that will make temperatures climb even higher. Above three degrees, we will see many vegetated areas turn into deserts. This shows projected changes, impacts, and risks for ocean regions and ecosystems compared to the temperature increase. Warm water corals are already in trouble from the 1.1 degree of warming that's already occurred and may disappear above 1.5 degrees. We are also seeing impacts to kelp forests. Above two degrees, we will see impacts to all but deep water habitats. The higher the temperatures climb, especially considering the increase of extreme heat waves, the more habitats will be impacted and the more will be lost. Climate change isn't the only stress on ecosystems and local communities. Clearing forests and other natural land for agriculture or development is also a major threat to ecosystems and wildlife. Other threats include poaching, overfishing, pollution, and invasive species. But climate change makes all of these worse. It acts as a threat multiplier. And because humans rely on a healthy environment for their existence and well-being, impacts to ecosystems equate to impacts to people. The coronavirus pandemic is an example of that, and possibly a harbinger of worse to come. So, what can we do about it? There are two basic types of responses to climate change. Mitigation means reducing the sources and enhancing the sinks of greenhouse gases to reduce the extent to which climate change happens. Adaptation is reducing the negative impacts of the change that does happen by adjusting natural and human systems to reduce the harm. We already have the technology to reduce climate change by replacing fossil fuels with renewable energy and capturing atmospheric carbon in plants and soils. Project Drawdown identified 80 different solutions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions or remove CO2 from the atmosphere. But no single solution can do the job. We have to consider all of them. Most of them would actually save money. First of all, we have to stop burning fossil fuels. Electricity production accounts for 25% of greenhouse gas emissions globally. Facing out hydrofluorocarbons, which are used as refrigerants, would have an enormous impact. 
Hydrofluorocarbons, or HFCs, trap thousands of times as much heat as a molecule of CO2. Capturing HFCs from discarded air conditioners instead of letting them leak into the atmosphere could avoid the equivalent of 90 gigatons of CO2 emissions. And phasing out HFCs could avoid another 25 to 78 gigatons. Other industry solutions include reducing waste and increasing energy efficiency. This will also save companies money. Transportation is responsible for 14% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Solutions include alternative means of transportation, increasing fuel efficiency, and switching to electric vehicles. Buildings and homes can also be more energy efficient. Reducing food waste and meat consumption are the number three and four ways we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions. As far as land use, we have to stop destroying forests and other natural ecosystems. We can also change agricultural practices to sequester more carbon. Population growth and resource consumption are key drivers of land use change, climate change, and biodiversity loss. Four strategies can reduce population growth, educating girls, family planning, empowering women in the workplace and society, and, although it may seem counterintuitive, reducing infant and child mortality. Land SIGs currently sequester 26% of human-caused carbon emissions. Coastal waters and oceans also trap greenhouse gases. Restoring degraded land and ecosystems can increase the amount of carbon pulled out of the atmosphere. Solar radiation management is a type of engineering to reduce the amount of solar energy reaching the Earth's surface by reflecting sunlight. Methods include deploying space reflectors, atmospheric aerosols, and reflectors in deserts and rooftops. Painting rooftops and parking lots white would um, also reflect sunlight and reduce the heat in urban areas. A better solution is to cover rooftops and parking lots with solar panels, which would not only reduce solar heating, they would convert much of the sunlight to electricity. Carbon dioxide removal is generally cheaper than solar radiation management. Some proposals include fertilizing oceans with iron to create algal blooms that sink to the seafloor, exposing mantle minerals like olivine that combine with carbon, although this would be very damaging and expensive, and injecting CO2 underground, as is done in some oil extraction. All three of these are controversial with potentially problematic side effects. A much less intensive form of CO2 removal with a lot of co-benefits is sequestering it in plants and soils. We already have a perfectly engineered device to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. They're called plants. In their biomass and soil, forests are powerful carbon storehouses. Forest protection prevents deforestation emissions, which are 10 to 15 percent of global emissions, and enables ongoing carbon sequestration. The most critical of all forest types is primary or old growth forest. Examples include Tongass National Forest in Alaska, the Great Bear Rainforest of British Columbia, and the Amazon and Congo rainforests. With mature canopy trees and complex understories, these forests contain 300 billion tons of carbon and are the greatest repositories of biodiversity on the planet. The benefits of forest conservation include not only carbon sequestration, but biodiversity protection, flood protection, aquifer recharge, recreation, and many other ecosystem services. Restoring degraded land can sequester CO2 in plants and soils. Depending on the current condition of the land, there are practices to optimize its carbon storage potential. Biochar is a type of charcoal used as a soil amendment. It can sequester carbon in soil for thousands of years and also reduces pressure on forests by retaining soil fertility on farmland.
The vulnerability of a species, ecosystem, or human community to climate change is a factor of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. Exposure measures the local change in climatic conditions. Sensitivity measures how much that change might affect a certain species, ecosystem, or community. And adaptive capacity measures the ability of a species, ecosystem, or community to respond to the threats. The most recent Global Climate Summit, COP26, was held recently. Importantly, countries agreed to attempt to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And if they fulfill the promises they made before and during the summit, warming could be limited to 1.8 degrees, far less destructive than the 4 to 5 degrees Celsius forecast when countries were doing nothing. Hundreds of financial institutions and other businesses also committed to net zero emissions by 2050. And more than 140 countries pledged to reverse deforestation by 2030. Follow-up is needed to ensure that signatories meet and exceed their climate pledges and start bending the emissions curve now rather than waiting until it's too late. Now I'll talk about climate change adaptation strategies. I'm mostly going to discuss it from an ecological standpoint, but it applies to human communities and infrastructure also. These include resistance, which is attempting to keep a system intact and relatively unchanged. Resilience, which is improving the system's ability to bounce back from a disturbance. And transformation, which is facilitating the system to respond in new ways, like planting species adapted to a hotter climate. Resistance strategies include things like protecting existing ecosystems from development, over-harvesting, and stressors like fire, disease, and invasive species. They also include restoration, like restoring degraded streams and planting riparian vegetation, restoring wetlands and dune systems, and other ecosystems. Resistance strategies also include protecting climate refugia, which are areas that heat up slower or remain moist as the climate changes. Environmental changes, whether relatively sudden, like fires, storms, or floods, or more gradual, like changes in climate, are typically patchy. Some areas are affected more than others. Refugia are areas where species, natural communities, or ecosystems can persist within a larger area that has been rendered inhospitable. They can occur at different scales of space and time and provide temporary safe havens. Effective climate refugia protect at-risk species and ecosystems, may often, although not always, occur in large natural areas, and provide connectivity stepping stones and population resilience. Disturbance refugia are areas more likely to persist through disturbances like fire, drought, storms, or insect outbreaks, or more likely to recover from them. Since climate change is likely to increase the frequency and magnitude of many types of disturbances, identifying disturbance refugia is essential to maintain local species and ecosystems. This figure shows examples of processes and landscape features that help form disturbance refugia. These can be natural, like terrain shading, rivers and lakes, or moist soils, or human constructs like roads and trails. Roads can have many negative ecological effects, but can serve as fire breaks. Climatic refugia operate in longer scales of time. Such areas are relatively buffered from changes in regional environmental conditions, like temperature or moisture, and allow organisms to persist as long as local conditions remain tolerable. Climate change refugia may only be temporary for a given species, but can delay ecosystem transitions for decades or longer. They can serve as a slow lane, protecting native species and ecosystems from negative effects of climate change in the short term, providing longer term havens for overall biodiversity and ecosystem function, and reducing the risk of extinctions. This isn't the first time species have had to adapt to a changing climate, although it's happening a lot quicker now and potentially to a greater extreme. During the Pleistocene, 
organisms took refuge from unfavorable climate conditions during glacial advances and retreats. These areas acted as sources for colonization later when conditions beyond the refugia became more favorable. For example, areas in the southeast U.S. served as refugia during the last glacial maximum, 18 to 25,000 years ago. This picture shows examples of areas that can provide suitable climate refugia. Shaded areas like north facing slopes receive less solar heating and will stay cooler by around 2 to 6 degrees Celsius, depending on steepness and other factors. Valleys and coves that pool cold air will also stay cooler. Areas near large deep lakes or oceans will also warm more slowly due to the high heat capacity of water. Cold water springs and streams will remain relatively cold if fed by groundwater. Persistent snow can provide critical habitat for species like snowshoe hares and wolverines. And tree canopies can keep the ground beneath them cooler during the day. Wet areas, including wetlands, riparian zones, and fog belts, can act as climate change refugia, especially if fed by groundwater. They can remain wet or moist during droughts. This moisture can also cool the air. Many wetlands, especially if underlain by impermeable clay or water-retaining peat, can hold water for a long time. Wetlands, as long as their soils are saturated or moist, are more resistant to fire and may also protect surrounding uplands from drought and fire. For humans, protecting and restoring forests and wetlands can reduce flooding during storms and retain needed water during droughts, among their many other benefits. Here are some examples of climate change refugia in the Sierra Nevada range, including areas where cold temperatures and snowpacks persist, areas that are less likely to burn, wet areas, and old growth forest. In arid or semi-arid regions, groundwater fed seeps and springs are biodiversity hotspots. Many contain rare species, like the Moaba dace shown here. Some springs may provide stable hydrologic refugia during droughts and are critical to fish and other water-dependent species. They also provide sources of water and food for nearby wildlife. The groundwater source must be protected for these springs to persist and native vegetation protected or restored. Cold water aquatic organisms like salmon, trout, hellbenders, and spring salamanders are among the most vulnerable species to climate change. Streams and rivers with cold groundwater inputs provide cold, sustained stream flows in regions where water temperatures would otherwise become too warm or stream flows too low during the summer months. Shading by valley walls or trees can also help regulate stream temperatures. Sufficiently large and connected cold water stream networks can provide refugia for sensitive freshwater organisms facing increasing pressures from temperature increases and other stressors. The figure on the left illustrates a sample aquatic refugia system. Refugia should meet all the species' habitat needs, as well as shelter from high temperatures, floods, and droughts. And they should be large enough and connected enough to support viable populations. In some cases, barriers, depicted by a black bar in the figure, may be needed to keep out predators, invasive competitors, or diseases. The surrounding drainage area, or watershed, should be managed to provide stable flows and minimize pollution. The figure on the right shows cold water refuges in Massachusetts, the dark blue circles, A, under current conditions, and B, and a modeled four degrees Celsius warming scenario. Red circles indicate existing cold water refuges likely to lose cold water habitat in summer months. Resilience strategies improve a system's ability to bounce back from a disturbance. This can be done by reducing other ecosystem stressors like restoring native vegetation, limiting pollution, reducing hazardous fuels and thereby preventing catastrophic fires and controlling invasive species and pathogens. Wildlife can be helped by providing things like nest boxes if needed.
Finally, transformation strategies help ecosystems to respond in new ways. For example, improving landscape connectivity to allow wildlife and plant range shifts, or adding species that are more heat tolerant, or if applicable, drought tolerant or salt tolerant. Climate corridors can facilitate long distance migration of species as the climate changes. Climate corridors can be modeled between current and future distributions of species or climate types. Some examples include preserving natural corridors or stepping stones from south to north or up to higher elevations, allowing species to move to more suitable climates. Likewise, corridors can be identified from drought impacted areas to areas with more available water. Streams and rivers and the adjacent riparian zone can make especially suitable corridors if they are protected and restored if necessary. Climate adaptation will often employ multiple types of strategies. At Blackwater National Wildlife Refuge, Dredged silt and sand were used to build up an area of marsh that was disappearing from sea level rise. Marsh grasses were planted and invasive nutria removed. The refuge is also acquiring forest and farmland at adjacent higher elevations where the marsh can migrate over time and continue to provide marsh bird habitat and other benefits. There's often overlap between adaptation and mitigation. For example, saving and restoring coastal marsh also sequesters carbon in the form of peat. Everyone can help bend the curve away from the most catastrophic climate change consequences. You can reduce your personal climate footprint. You can ask your legislators, governors, and other political leaders to support climate action. And you can work locally to support climate resilience. You can plant pollinator habitat. You can help restore ecosystems. You can support land protection efforts. And you can plant trees. Here are some of my sources of information. Thank you for watching. You can visit the links for more detailed information.